Chapter 7 Experiments in Consciousness At the core of every religion lies an undeniable claim about the human condition. It is possible to have one's experience of the world radically transformed. Although we generally live within the limits imposed by our ordinary uses of attention, we wake, we work, we eat, we watch television, we converse with others, we sleep, we dream. Most of us know, however dimly, that extraordinary experiences are possible. The problem with religion is that it blends this truth so thoroughly with the venom of unreason. Take Christianity as an example. It is not enough that Jesus was a man who transformed himself to such a degree that the Sermon on the Mount could be his heart's confession. He also had to be the Son of God, born of a virgin, and destined to return to earth trailing clouds of glory. The effect of such dogma is to place the example of Jesus forever out of reach. His teaching ceases to be a set of empirical claims about the linkage between ethics and spiritual insight, and instead becomes a gratuitous and rather gruesome fairy tale. According to the dogma of Christianity, becoming just like Jesus is impossible. One can only enumerate one's sins, believe the unbelievable, and await the end of the world. But a more profound response to existence is possible for us, and the testimony of Jesus, as well as that of countless other men and women over the ages, attests to this. The challenge for us is to begin talking about this possibility in rational terms. The Search for Happiness Though the lilies of the field are admirably clothed, you and I were driven from the womb naked and squalling. What do we need to be happy? Almost everything we do can be viewed as a reply to this question. We need food, shelter, and clothing. We need the company of others. Then we need to learn countless things to make the most of this company. We need to find work that we enjoy, and we need time for leisure. We need so many things, and there seems no alternative but to seek and maintain them, one after the next, hour after hour. But are such things sufficient for happiness? Is a person guaranteed to be happy merely by virtue of having health? wealth and good company? Apparently not. Are such things even necessary for happiness? If so, what can we make of those Indian yogis who renounce all material and familial attachments, only to spend decades alone in caves practicing meditation? It seems that such people can be happy as well. Indeed, some of them claim to be perfectly so. It is difficult to find a word for that human enterprise which aims at happiness directly, that happiness of a sort that can survive the frustration of all conventional desires. The term spirituality seems unavoidable here, and I have used it several times in this book already, but it has many connotations that are frankly embarrassing. Mysticism has more gravitas, perhaps, but it has unfortunate associations of its own. Neither word captures the reasonableness and profundity of the possibility that we must now consider, that there is a form of well-being that supersedes all others, indeed, that transcends the vagaries of experience itself. I will use both spirituality and mysticism interchangeably here, because there are no alternatives, but the reader should remember that I am using them in a restricted sense. While a visit to any New Age bookstore will reveal that modern man has embraced a daunting range of spiritual preoccupations, ranging from the healing power of crystals and colonic irrigation to the ardors of alien abduction, our discussion will focus on a specific insight that seems to have special relevance to our pursuit of happiness. Most spiritual teachings agree that there is more to happiness than becoming a productive member of society a cheerful consumer of every licit pleasure, and an enthusiastic bearer of children, disposed to do the same. Indeed, many suggest that it is our search for happiness, our craving for knowledge and new experience, our desire for recognition, our efforts to find the right romantic partner, even our yearning for spiritual experience itself, 
that causes us to overlook a form of well-being that is intrinsic to consciousness in every present moment. Some version of this insight seems to lie at the core of many of our religions, and yet it is by no means always easy to discern among the articles of faith. While many of us go for decades without experiencing a full day of solitude, we live every moment in the solitude of our own minds. However close we may be to others, our pleasures and pains are ours alone. Spiritual practice is often recommended as the most rational response to this situation. The underlying claim here is that we can realize something about the nature of consciousness in this moment that will improve our lives. The experience of countless contemplatives suggests that consciousness, being merely the condition in which thought, emotion, and even our sense of self arises, is never actually changed by what it knows. That which is aware of joy does not become joyful. That which is aware of sadness does not become sad. From the point of view of consciousness, we are merely aware of sights, sounds, sensations, moods, and thoughts. Many spiritual teachings allege that if we can recognize our identity as consciousness itself, as the mere witness of appearances, we will realize that we stand perpetually free of the vicissitudes of experience. This is not to deny that suffering has a physical dimension. The fact that a drug like Prozac can relieve many of the symptoms of depression suggests that mental suffering can be no more ethereal than a little green pill. But the arrow of influence clearly flies both ways. We know that ideas themselves have the power to utterly define a person's experience of the world. Even the significance of intense physical pain is open to subjective interpretation. Consider the pain of labor. How many women come away from the experience traumatized? The occasion itself is generally a happy one, assuming all goes well with the birth. Imagine how different it would be for a woman to be tortured by having the sensations of a normal labor inflicted upon her by a mad scientist. The sensations might be identical, and yet this would certainly be among the worst experiences of her life. There is clearly more to suffering, even physical pain, than painful sensation alone. Our spiritual traditions suggest that we have considerable room here to change our relationship to the contents of consciousness, and thereby to transform our experience of the world. Indeed, a vast literature on human spirituality attests to this. It is also clear that nothing need be believed on insufficient evidence for us to look into this possibility with an open mind. Consciousness Like Descartes, most of us begin these inquiries as thinkers, condemned by the terms of our subjectivity to maneuver in a world that appears to be other than what we are. Descartes accentuated this dichotomy by declaring that two substances were to be found in God's universe, matter and spirit. For most of us, a dualism of this sort is more or less a matter of common sense, though the term spirit seems rather majestic, given how our minds generally comport themselves. As science has turned its reifying light upon the mysteries of the human mind, however, Descartes' dualism, along with our own folk psychology, has come in for some rough treatment. Bolstered by the undeniable successes of three centuries of purely physical research, many philosophers and scientists now reject Descartes' separation of mind and body, spirit and matter, as the concession to Christian piety that it surely was, and imagine that they have thereby erased the conceptual gulf between consciousness and the physical world. In the last chapter we saw that our beliefs about consciousness are intimately linked to our ethics. They also happen to have a direct bearing upon our view of death. Most scientists consider themselves physicalists. This means, among other things, that they believe that our mental and spiritual lives are wholly dependent upon the workings of our brains. On this account, when the brain dies, the stream of our being must come to an end. Once the lamps of neural activity have been extinguished, there will be nothing left to survive. Indeed, many scientists purvey this conviction as though it were itself a special sacrament.
conferring intellectual integrity upon any man, woman, or child.